All right, well, uh, I, I was asked to talk about forage quality, so I hope some of you have some cattle. Uh, Suzanne's here, do y'all have cows or cattle? No, not anymore, but I rent, we rent our hay land. Oh, okay, all right. Well, I, hay, and that's what I told them last week, and, and I, I go through there and spot kill the Johnson grass, <laughs> even though it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's my land, but we're renting. Right. But he said it was okay. I told, I told the guy, I just told the guy, because, I mean, I practically saw him raised from the time he was born, <laughs> that I was going to be killing Johnson grass. It's okay. And he said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, that's not bad quality. My daddy was right a farmer. Time. All right. And so uh, I don't like Johnson, Johnson grass. Well, right that, uh, well, this is probably going to be pretty short, too, because uh, I was going to do more question-answer type things. Well, we used to have cows, so you can try asking something. I'm like, I'm not going to just go ahead. Well, you can try asking something. So anyway, I'm going to give just kind of a brief overview, but, it, but forage quality is really just the capability of a plant to produce the animal product that you're looking for, whether it be meat, milk, or whatever. Uh, it encompasses about three things, is the acceptability of the forage to the, uh, to the animal, uh, the chemical uh, composition of that forage, and the digestibility uh, of the forage. Now, um, I guess everybody knows why a ruminant animal can, can actually eat forage or grass or something like that uh, for nutrition, and, and we as humans would starve to death eating that. So, so basically ruminant animals, they've got the rumen and that's just, it's filled with microorganisms and that's what's actually digesting the forage. Um, and things, so it's got nothing to do, or it's a very different system than our digestive system. Um, they break the forage down, they release ammonia, uh, some of what they call the volatile fatty acids, propionic, um, butyric, and acetic, and that's absorbed by the animal, and that's used as an energy source. And then once it passes out of the rumen, uh, their digestive tract is just like all the all other animals. So, and, and they actually digest the bacteria and fungi and things, and that's where they get their protein and, and things like that. Um, so, basically, what in a forage management system, what they try to do is look at some lab procedures with that would predict how animals will perform on those forage crops. Uh, so in the early 1960s, I guess late 1950s and through the 1970s, there's a lot of work on trying to get lab procedures that would relate to, if I say it's this quality, that will give you some indication of how the animal will perform. And uh, there, there was a, a lot of work done at that time. The first thing was they, they determined digestibility. And what they did there is they actually took fluid out of the rumen and they put it in test tubes with a known amount of a forage sample and left it for a certain period of time and then drained off the fluid and dried that sample and then the difference in weight of what they put in and what came out is what they term digestibility. So you can you can have things that range from probably 30 something percent to 70 something percent digestible. Uh, and kind of depends on the stage of growth of the, uh, of the forage. And from that they proceeded to try to look at, okay, what are the components that um, that make up this forage quality. So then the focus became uh, kind of a, um, uh, about the fiber. And that's how much of the fiber can be digested is a big component. So they came up with two, there's two terms in there. Uh, you'll see in reports on forage quality, you'll see something called NDF and ADF. 
and those are just related to the fiber component uh, in there. Now, all, when NDF stands for neutral detergent fiber, and again, they just take a, sound, a known weight of the, of the forage, they put it in a, uh, in a beaker there with a, what they call a neutral detergent fiber, and it's left for a period of time, and you take it out and weigh it again and compare those weights. And basically what you're doing there is you're extracting everything except for the cell wall of the plant. Um, and all of that material that's extracted in that period of time is probably about 98 to 99% digestible. So anything that's uh, extracted with the neutral detergent is digestible by the animal by like about a hundred percent. Oh, uh, now, and I guess to, kind of going back to this, I mean, plants don't have bones. Uh, and so what they have is cell walls to give them any rigidity at all. That's why a plant can grow upright without bones. Um, their cells have a cell wall. Our cells don't have cell walls, we just have membranes. Um, so we wouldn't be, we couldn't stand upright without a bone structure. And plants not having a bone structure, they've got to have something there. So what they do is they make, they have a membrane and then they coat that membrane with cellulose and hemocellulose and things like that. And these, these are bound together with pectins and things like this that stick the cells together. Uh, and all. So a lot of forage quality relates to how digestible that cell wall is, which is the fiber component. Uh, the, um, the cell wall is, is cellulose, hemocellulose, and lignin. Uh, basically, when you get through with the neutral detergent fiber digestion, what you're left with is those three components, hemocellulose, cellulose, and lignin. Now you go to the next step and you put it in a, what's called an acid detergent fiber and that's got an acidic thing to it and you leave it a period of time and basically what that does, it breaks down the hemocellulose and a little bit of the cellulose and those become um, nutrients that the animal can use because cellulose and uh, cellulose is just basically glucose that's bound together in long strings or chains to make a fiber. So once you can digest that, that's, I mean, basically you got glucose. So it's an energy, it's a sugar, uh, very highly digestible and things. So anything you can break down in, in that cell wall is going to be highly digestible. And that's what these microorganisms are doing. And they use the sugar and things for their energy and release different components that the animal absorbs and all. But when you get through with the acid detergent fiber, what you're left with is something called lignin and some cellulose. You're breaking down almost all the hemocellulose, <coughs> which again is a, is a sugar, it's just a string of sugar molecules, but it has fructose and galactose and several others, not just the uh, uh, glucose. <coughs> so now the acid or the ADF or the acid detergent fiber, when you, whatever amount that is, that's telling you that it, that is non-digestible by the animal. That's gonna pass right through the animal, provide no nutrition whatsoever. So. The goal is to have low fiber. And if you got fiber, you want it to be NDF type fiber, a high percentage and less ADF. And the, <coughs> the way you do that is, the longer that plant grows, the higher the concentration of ADF becomes. So basically it all comes down to harvesting what's called an immature plant. Uh, as being the highest quality. Once you start getting seed heads or stems with seed heads on it, that's gonna be highly lignified and a lot of cellulose, not as much hemocellulose, 
and it's not going to be digestible by the animal. Now, the quantity goes up, as everybody knows. Quantity goes up the longer you wait, just like mowing your grass. If you mow it every week, it's less quantity or it's not quite as tall as if you mow it every month. So, uh, but the quality is going to be less if you're mowing every month versus every week and that sort of thing, just because of the plant fiber. And the reason the plant fiber increases is that cell wall, once it's developed, it's a certain size. But the plant continues making a cell, it just thickens the cell wall continuously. But it doesn't get it, build it on the outside, it puts it on the inside of the cell. So as it ages and gets a secondary cell wall and a tertiary cell wall and others, there's less and less area on the inside of that cell for these soluble products that are 98, 99% digestible. So over time, you're getting less and less of those and more and more fiber. Uh, so a big thing with uh, uh, forage quality is how much fiber is there and how old is that fiber uh, in thing. Also an important aspect, uh, well, just to go back, you control the amount of fiber based on the maturity of the forage. So you want to get it as immature as you can, but if you're producing hay, it's not practical to cut it every week or two weeks. You wouldn't get enough to justify the cost of, of that equipment and things. So you got to leave it a period of time to get enough accumulated uh, out there. Now, fertilization will have very little effect on that part of quality as far as the fiber is concerned because what determines the, the amount of fiber is the age. It's not about fertilization and things. So you got to balance quantity and quality in that aspect as far as grazing or hay uh, situation. Now, the other term that's kind of important in forage quality is crude protein. Uh, and, and the reason it is referred to as crude protein is they are not in the lab analysis, they are not measuring protein. They're actually measuring the nitrogen content and typically you take the nitrogen, whatever you measure as the nitrogen content of that forage you multiply it by 6.25 and that gives you the percentage of crude protein. Uh, not all nitrogen is in the form of protein, but uh, protein is basically 16% nitrogen. Uh, and, and, and proteins are, I mean, like most of the enzymes in your body, that's a protein and all that sort of thing. So, so they, they are usually, the, composition, the chemical composition is 16% nitrogen. So that's why you can measure nitrogen, multiply it by 6.25, because if you multiply 16 times 6.25, you get to 100. Now, in ruminant animals, this is not a bad way to, to measure uh, protein level because the microorganisms in the rumen can use nitrogen by itself to make amino acids and then combine those into different proteins. In our bodies, we can't use straight nitrogen and make proteins. We, but, so this is a part of the function of the rumen there. So just measuring nitrogen is, is a good uh, measure of forage quality because the microorganisms can use just nitrogen. That's why when you'll see on a feed tag a lot of times, they will have something called percent N, NPN, which is non-protein nitrogen. Typically that's gonna be urea. Uh, you can feed a ruminant animal urea, feed grade urea, now I wouldn't try it with fertilizers, at a certain percent, and that animal or those microorganisms in the rumen will use that nitrogen and make proteins. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, you, so all you gotta measure is the protein. That's why on a, on a feed sample or a forage sample, you'll see the word crude protein. That, all they did was measure the, 
the nitrogen uh, component of that. Now, <clears throat> since those kind of procedures have come about, and they, they were kind of in the 60s, 70s and all, and that's what the forage labs, they've been trying to work on how do I come up with a um, sort of a one type thing that I can look at one value and say this is better quality than this. Uh, because I can tell you that in legumes such as clovers or things like that, the NDF is more digestible than the NDF from a grass. So there's a little difference in the digestibility of, the, of even that component uh, in grasses versus legumes. So you're not getting a real true measure uh, there from, um, <clears throat> from comparing those two. So, how, so they try to come up with a value. And the, the latest thing that probably came out in the 2000s is called, well, they first came up with relative forage value or RFV you'll see on some things. And that's really, they use that to kind of price hay in these hay markets and things, but it doesn't give you, it doesn't really include all the digestible components of that. So here more recently, they come up with a value called an RFQ <clears throat> and you, it's called relative forage quality. Um, and you'll just see RFQ equals a certain number. Uh, it could be 90 something, it could be 100, it could be 200. I've seen samples that are 245 uh, in, in forages from Louisiana. So, uh, basically what that is, is that looks at the dry matter intake of the animal, and dry matter intake of the animal is controlled primarily by the digestibility of NDF, now, how fast it is digested. So they take a, a digestibility or, or a rate of digestion of the, of the NDF and combine it with what's called total digestible nutrients, which is an energy term that has been used in forage thing or, or forage analysis for a while that gives you an idea of the energy content of that forage. They combine these two and then in the equation, I'll probably really confuse you here, they divide it by 1.23. And, and that's, that is a random <laughs> number, but not really random. Uh, basically what they're doing with that is making full bloom alfalfa equal 100. So that, that is a non, you know, that value just is related to not to full bloom alfalfa, which is considered poor quality alfalfa. So if you get an RFQ of hundred, you've got some pretty poor quality alfalfa, but, you, but, but they use this across everything. Uh, I mean, all grasses and things like that. So you're really comparing to that, what is the quality of alfalfa at full bloom? Oh, uh, so you can, as I said, I've seen some from some in the 80s and last year we had a sample in a hay quality thing that had a, an RFQ of 245. Now that is very high quality feed. You could feed that hay to any animal out there and they would gain weight. Uh, if you're looking at an RFQ of 100, it's kind of considered fair feed, but you're going to probably have to supplement that feed with either protein or energy. Now the RFQ, you can't use it in, in determining a, a ration for cattle. It is only a comparison between forages to say this one's better than this one based on that number. And the higher the number, the better it is. Uh, but you have to go back to the crude protein measurement and the TDN actual measurement if you're actually trying to figure out, do I have enough nutrients in this hay to meet the animal's requirements uh, and things. And I think that's pretty much all I was gonna talk about unless there were questions. So 
if you do have questions, if you see this video, have questions, get in touch with Kylie. She can answer all those questions. <laughs> or, or Kylie can get you in touch with me and, and we can discuss those. But anyway, I appreciate the, the opportunity thing, to be here. The only thing I wanted to add is that, the, that we have a forage lab now and we brought some paperwork to if anyone that's right. I, I should have mentioned that. The Forage Lab, the LSU Forage Lab, reopened last year uh, to, to run samples so you can, uh, you can put hay samples or forage, just any kind of forage samples through that lab and get an idea of the quality uh, and things. So, and that would be get in touch with Kylie or you can find it online or whatever and she can help you get those forms.